Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Chancellor Dr. Sharon Gaber. Thank you and good evening. Welcome to the Dubois Center at UNC Charlotte Center City. I wanna thank you for joining us for the 2023 Chancellor's Speaker Series. This is an annual event that delves into critical topics impacting our community and beyond. This year, I'm delighted to announce our partnership with WFAE, our media partner, for this series. I extend a warm welcome to those joining us via the live stream on WFAE.org. Before we begin this evening's presentation, I'd like to extend a welcome to dis some distinguished guests who are here tonight. First, I want to introduce our uh, the UNC Charlotte Board of Trustees Chair and Alumnus, Dennis Bunker. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Dr. Norm Schull, the founding director of Charlotte's Urban Institute. And I'd like to thank all of the elected officials and community leaders that are here tonight. Your dedicated efforts in shaping our community are deeply appreciated. Since its inception, let's give them a hand, please. <laughs> Since its inception in 2011, this series has celebrated UNC Charlotte's pivotal role as the intellectual heart of the Charlotte region. We've had the privilege of hosting eminent voices who have shared their wisdom with us, including former White House Chief of Staff, UNC System President Erskine Bowles and Senator Alan Simpson, journalists Carl Bernstein and PJ O'Rourke, ESPN correspondent Tom Rinaldi, and Jeb Bush, former Florida governor, and Janet Napolitano, former US Secretary of Homeland Security. Tonight, we have the privilege of welcoming yet another distinguished speaker, Dr. Raj Chetty, a Harvard University professor of economics and the director of Opportunity Insights. Dr. Chetty's work focuses on a crucial subject, economic mobility, a topic that's the core of our university's mission. It's been nearly a decade since Dr. Chetty published his research that ranked Charlotte 50th out of 50 top cities in the nation for economic mobility. Tonight, Dr. Chetty will share his latest research about social capital as a predictor of economic mobility. Following his presentation, WFAE's Eli Portillo will guide us through a Q&A with Dr. Chetty, taking a deeper look at how his research can power great possibilities in our region. At Charlotte, we take immense pride in our role as a catalyst for opportunity within our community. Our university is the choice of over 30,000 students who have made North Carolina's Urban Research University their home. We provide internationally recognized academic programs and research leading to innovations that foster a healthier, more efficient, and resilient society. We infuse our region with cultural enrichment from captivating visual and performing arts to championship level athletics, making Charlotte more vibrant each day. Our impact is evident in our recognition as a top 100 public research university by US News and World Report. But what truly sets UNC Charlotte apart is our simultaneous emphasis on academic excellence, affordability, and accessibility. This unique combination is at the heart of our commitment to enhancing economic mobility for our students and their families, ultimately resulting in a lasting and transformative influence on their lives. In fact, UNC Charlotte ranks number one among all North Carolina four-year institutions for community college transfer students, for first-generation college students, for bachelor's degrees awarded to underrepresented students, for Latinx enrollment and bachelor's degrees awarded, and for enrolled students receiving Pell Grants. We take great pride in being this great city's great university. And I am delighted to have Dr. Raj Chetty with us tonight to discuss his research on economic mobility, a mission that drives us every single day. Please welcome Dr. Chetty.
Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Gaber, for the very warm introduction. And thank you all for being here. It's really a privilege and an honor uh, to be here in Charlotte, having worked on the study that I think many of you know from 10 years ago, uh, looking at mobility across cities in America. It's been incredibly inspiring to see what's transpired in Charlotte since then. And I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share a bit more about what we've learned about the science of economic opportunity and where I think we can go from here. So to set the stage, I'm gonna start with a map uh, that I think many of you have seen in various renditions. For those who haven't, I'm gonna briefly describe how we construct this map of economic mobility in America, the geography of opportunity, and then tell you what I think we learned from it and how that motivates uh, the work that's been done in Charlotte over the past 10 years and what we can do to increase economic opportunity in Charlotte and beyond. So what we're doing here is using data, a sort of a big data approach to study economic opportunity in America. We're taking data on 20 million kids, essentially all kids born in the United States in the late 1970s and early 1980s, linking them back to their parents using information from anonymized tax returns covering the entire US population, mapping them back to the exact area in which they grew up, dividing the US into 740 different metro and rural areas, and in each of those areas, calculating a very simple measure of upward mobility. We ask, what is the average household income that kids report on their 1040 tax forms when they're 35 years old uh, among the set of children who grew up in low-income families? And we're gonna define low-income families as families making $27,000 a year, which puts you at the 25th percentile of the national income distribution in the United States. We color the map so that uh, red orange colors represent areas with lower levels of upward mobility, where you're less likely to rise up and achieve the American dream in some sense. And blue green colors represent areas with higher levels of upward mobility. Now, if you start by looking at the scale in the lower right hand side of this map, you can see that there's an enormous amount of variation across areas in the United States in terms of children's chances of rising up. There's some parts of the country, like much of the rural Midwest, take a place like Dubuque, Iowa, for example, where kids growing up in families making $27,000 a year, one generation later are making $45,000 a year on average, a substantial amount of upward mobility in a single generation. Yet there are other places in America, like Charlotte, where kids growing up in families making $27,000 a year end up on average actually making less than their parents did, 26,300, when they're in their mid-30s, which is you know, a remarkable and disheartening statistic given the tremendous amount of economic growth that's occurred in the United States over the past 30 years, and in Charlotte in particular, as you all know. So when we first put out these data, and we, this is an updated version of some statistics we put out back in 2014, where we constructed measures like this for the 50 largest cities in America, and we found, as you see in the data shown in this map, that Charlotte ranks 50th out of the 50 largest cities in America in terms of rates of upward mobility, there was, as you all know here, an interesting and you know, powerful reaction here in Charlotte, where here's an article from the Charlotte Observer that calls this a wake-up call for Charlotte and talks about, you know, asks, I think, the critical question. If you look at the bottom here, how can Charlotte be such a vital and opportunity-rich community on the one hand, yet be ranked dead last in the odds that our low-income children and youth will be able to move up the economic ladder. And that, I think, has motivated a lot of inspiring efforts to make a change on this front, and I'll come back to that in the end, and hopefully we can have a conversation about where uh, things are headed. But uh, just as this was a wake-up call for folks here in Charlotte, for us as researchers and academics, as social scientists, this was also in many ways a wake-up call for us because we started to realize that this sort of map and these data provided a new way to study economic opportunity with a granularity and a precision that we simply hadn't had in the past. To make an analogy, it was like having for the first time a microscope to study these issues of economic opportunity that social scientists have never had. So rather than comparing across countries or different time periods, you could start to ask questions like, what's different about Dubuque versus Charlotte versus Chicago versus Cincinnati? What happens when kids move from one of these cities to another city? What are the factors that predict these differences in economic mobility? And so essentially, what our research team, Opportunity Insights, based at Harvard, has been occupied with, motivated by that logic over the past 10 years or so, is essentially trying to unlock the science of economic opportunity 
using the variation of this map, trying to understand what the key drivers are of these differences in economic mobility with an eye towards then identifying policy solutions where if we can figure out you know, what's maybe different in Salt Lake City or rural Iowa, et cetera, maybe we can transport some of those ideas to other cities and thereby increase economic mobility throughout the United States. So motivated by that logic, and the short talk I'm gonna uh, give here today, I'm gonna briefly first summarize some of the key lessons we've learned over the years about the science of what drives upward mobility, and then spend most of the time talking about what we can actually do in terms of creating more mobility going forward. And I think much remains to be learned and uh, discussed on that front, so hopefully we'll have more time to talk about that with uh, Eli but uh, I will lay out some directions where we're seeing promising results uh, in terms of interventions. So starting from this map, we uh, did a series of studies where we started to disaggregate this data in different ways. We looked at differences, for example, by race and ethnicity, and we found that there were enormous differences in children's chances of rising up by race, with black boys in particular having much lower rates of upward mobility than white boys. But interestingly, if you compare black women and white women, they have very similar rates of economic mobility when they start out in families at the same income level. So that points to challenges that black men are specifically facing in the labor market or related to the criminal justice system or other factors that you might think of that might lead to those types of disparities that connect gender and race. We also began to look at the data at a more granular level, not just looking across cities, as you see in this map here, or broad regions, but rather zooming in to look at the data at a much finer geographic level. And just to show you um, that data, I'm gonna to toggle over to this tool here called the Opportunity Atlas. It's a website that anyone can go to, freely access. We're gonna start out with this national view of exactly the same statistics that I just showed you. But what you can do with this tool is type in any address, very much like a Google map, I'm just gonna type in Charlotte here, and we're literally gonna zoom in and see these data now at a neighborhood level. So in a subsequent study, you know, we started to construct these statistics not just at the level of Charlotte, but literally neighborhood by neighborhood in Charlotte and every other place in America. This data is being shown at the census tract level. Each census tract has about 4,000 people in it and we're literally taking the kids who grew up in that census tract and asking how they did in adulthood. Because you have data on the entire US population, you have enough information to be able to construct these statistics reliably. And so when you look at the data at this level of disaggregation, you know, I think two things pop out to me immediately looking at this map of Charlotte. First, you can see that while Charlotte on average has very low levels of economic mobility as we saw earlier, even within Charlotte, there are some areas that offer much better prospects for upward mobility than others. And the simple way to see that is the spectrum of colors that you're seeing on the map here, zoomed in at this local level, is the same as the spectrum of colors that you were seeing at the national level. You can go from the darkest reds to the deepest blues just within Charlotte and in pretty much any other city in America. So it's like you can drive two miles down the road and it's, it, it, that essentially takes you from Alabama to Iowa in terms of rates of economic opportunity. That very simple observation teaches you that the roots of these differences in economic mobility are not really about broad differences across states or across cities, or federal policies, things like that. No, it's often about what's happening in one set of neighborhoods versus another set of neighborhoods within a given city. The second thing that you can see, and this will be a familiar geographic pattern to all of you here familiar with the city, is you know, a clear segregation of economic opportunity where there's a crescent with much lower levels of economic mobility and sort of a wedge at the south side with much higher, with much better opportunities. And I think that accords with probably your day-to-day -day experience and other statistics that you've seen over time, here shown for this one particular measure that I think has a lot of relevance for a variety of issues. Okay, so using this sort of granular data, the next thing that we started to investigate is, you know, what is it at this very local level that are driving these differences in economic opportunity? We did a series of studies where we look at kids who move across different neighborhoods within Charlotte, in other cities, and the simple fact that you get out of what is now quite a large body of research from our team and many other social scientists is that what really matters is where you grow up, not where you live as an adult, where you grow up from something like birth till you're about 22 or 23 years old. Every extra year that you spend living in one of these blue-green colored neighborhoods, the better you do 
in the long run. And we see that when kids move at an earlier age to one of these blue-green colored areas, we, they have much better outcomes in terms of employment rates, income, education, and so forth in the long run, showing you that it is really possible to change people's trajectories by changing neighborhood environments. So naturally, the next question then, coming back here to the slides, is um, to ask, well, what is it that's producing higher levels of economic mobility in some neighborhoods relative to others? And so over the years, we and many others have correlated the data that we put out publicly in the Opportunity Atlas that I just showed you with a variety of different factors that people have thought might be important for, drive, for economic mobility. Here, I'm summarizing the four strongest predictors that we and others have identified over time. The first is lower poverty rates. More mixed income areas tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. So if you as a low income kid are growing up in a more mixed income neighborhood, you're more likely to rise up and achieve the American dream in some sense. Second, places with more stable family structures, more two parent families, for example, tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. Third, as you might expect intuitively, places with better schools, both at the K through 12 level and in terms of access to higher education, tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. And fourth, places with greater social capital tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. Now, this idea of social capital is something you may have heard of in other contexts. It's a concept that social scientists have discussed for more than 100 years. It captures something related to the strength of a community, who's connected to whom, what your networks look like, and so forth. Now, many people have had the intuition that social capital might be relevant for lots of different outcomes, from economic opportunity to health and so on. But we've lacked a precise measure of what exactly social capital is and how we might be able to change it and how we might be able to increase social capital insofar as it matters going forward. So in some of our most recent work, we took a stab at trying to measure social capital using a similar big data approach. In this case, you know, the natural big data to think about in the modern era is data from social networks. And so in particular, we set up a partnership with Mark Zuckerberg and the Facebook core data science team to measure social capital systematically across the United States, zip code by zip code, high school by high school, college by college, constructing many different measures of social capital that people have thought about over the years. And I'm gonna focus on one particular measure that turns out to be extremely relevant for thinking about economic mobility, and that's illustrated on this slide here. So just to set this up, first look at the map on the left, which is the Opportunity Atlas data that I already discussed from tax records showing rates of economic mobility across counties, in this case, in the United States. And you see the pattern similar to what I showed you on the first slide. The map on the right is a very different map. It's a map of the degree of cross-class interaction county by county in America. Again, let me describe how we construct it and then tell you what I think the key lessons are. So what we're doing here is taking data on for 72 million people who are on the Facebook platform. That's 84% of the US population between the ages of 25 and 44. So almost everyone in that age range in the US is on Facebook. We use a machine learning algorithm to predict everyone's income. And then we look at among low-income people on the Facebook uh, platform, so below median income folks, what fraction of their Facebook friends have above median income? So it's just a way of measuring the extent to which low and high income people are interacting with each other in each county. Red colors in the map on the right are places where low income folks have fewer high income friends, so there's more disconnection across class lines. The blue-green colored places are places with more cross-class interaction. If you look at the map on the right and the map on the left, you can see the result you know, immediately. You don't need fancy statistics to figure out that those two things look like they're quite highly correlated with each other. They seem strongly related. The places with higher levels of uh, cross-class connectedness, economic connectedness, like the rural Midwest, are exactly the places with higher levels of economic mobility. Now, we've done a series of uh, you know, additional analyses to investigate the strength of that relationship look at whether it's driven by economic connectedness itself or other confounding factors. And our best sense is that this really seems to be a critical factor in predicting uh, differences in economic mobility. It's the single strongest predictor that we or anybody else has identified to date. Why does it matter? We don't quite know yet, but there are many plausible reasons you can think of. So for instance, 
Uh, if you think about how many jobs are obtained in the United States, it's often through referrals. If you have a friend who works at a firm that pays a good salary, you might be more likely to get an internship or, or a job at that firm. That can be a pathway to upward mobility. But I think maybe even more importantly, these types of cross-class connections can affect kids' aspirations or you know, the types of career paths they think about pursuing. If you've never met anyone who's gone to college, that may not even be on your radar screen, but if you live in a community where lots of your friends' parents have gone to college or pursued a career in business or science or whatever it might be, that may change what kids uh, end up choosing to do. And we and others have some evidence suggesting that that mechanism uh, might be quite important. Whatever the reason, it seems like this kind of cross-class interaction is really crucial to focus on going forward to increase uh, economic mobility. Okay, so having shown you some of what we've learned in a you know, very quick overview uh, through a series of studies in the past few years, in the remaining few minutes here, I wanna talk about how we can take these lessons and use them to inform what I think we all here care most about, which is how we can actually make changes in policy, make changes in our own communities and institutions to increase upward mobility going forward. And I think in light of the data I've just shown you, there are three natural ways to try to think about how to address the problem. So in a nutshell, what I think we've learned from a decade of research on the science of economic opportunity is that the roots of differences in economic opportunity are hyper-local. It's about the exact neighborhood in which you're growing up. And what matters is childhood environment from something like birth to ages 22 or 23 because of factors like social capital and the schools you have and so on. So if you have that view of the world, I think you'd naturally think about three different ways to increase economic mobility. The first is to reduce segregation. You might say, if I know that there's more opportunity two miles down the road, why don't I try to help more low-income folks move to those better neighborhoods through housing vouchers or changes in affordable housing policies, changes in zoning restrictions, and so on. So that's one potentially viable approach. Second, recognizing that you can't possibly move everyone and not everyone wants to move. I think it's equally, if not more important, to think about place-based investment. How do you turn the red colored areas on the maps that I've been showing you into blue-green colors? And then third, recognizing, and particularly relevant to where we are today, you know, the key touch point for most kids after they're age 18 is not the home in which they're growing up, but the institution of higher education that they're attending. I think there's more that we can do to amplify the impacts of colleges on upward mobility. So let me take a couple of minutes to show you concretely how we're trying to make progress and what kinds of approaches seem promising in each of these domains before concluding. So let me start with the reducing segregation approach where I'm gonna take you to a different city, to Seattle, show you here another snapshot of the Opportunity Atlas where you see that familiar checkered pattern that you saw in Charlotte and that you see in many other cities. What we've done here is overlaid in the bright green dots the most common places where people receiving housing vouchers from the federal government currently live. In Seattle, these housing vouchers are worth about $1,500 a month. But you can see, you know, I think a quite surprising pattern where you when you look at where those dots are located, despite the fact that people are receiving that assistance of $1,500 a month, which adds up to billions of dollars that the federal government is spending on this program across more than about two and a half million families, those green dots, despite all that assistance, are still concentrated in the red and orange colored parts of the map. That is in places where we know, based on our prior research, people are not likely to break the cycle of poverty across generations. So that's kind of puzzling. We're trying to provide support to potentially help people find stable housing, move to better neighborhoods, and break out of the cycle of poverty, but the program doesn't really seem to be having that effect. So when we put out this Opportunity Atlas data, this level of granularity in 2018, um, a bunch of housing authorities and the Housing and Urban Development Agency noticed this pattern and approached us and said, you know, why do you think this is happening? Is there something that we can do from a concrete policy perspective to change this? And so what came out of that was a pilot study in Seattle called Creating Moves to Opportunity where we teamed up with the local housing authorities to set up a randomized trial to evaluate a program that basically provided, think of it as social capital or some social support to families receiving housing vouchers to move to a high opportunity area if they wanted to do so. So this came in the form of a counselor who would assist you in the housing search process, connect you with interested landlords, uh, and provide a little bit of financial assistance to pay a security deposit or an application fee if you needed it at the right time. 
so kind of some wraparound support services in addition to just giving you the cash voucher payment. Set up as a randomized trial, 1,000 families come in to apply for a voucher, 500 of them get the, just the voucher itself, for the 500 in the treatment group get the additional social support. Follow the families over time, see where they end up moving, and you see a very clear result. In the control group, only 14% of families move to a high opportunity area, consistent with the map that I showed you earlier. In the treatment group, that number jumps up to more than 55, to about 55%. So now the majority of the families are living in those blue-green colored areas, and we estimate as a result of this relatively inexpensive intervention, it costs about $2,500 per family. Not a small sum, but relative to the impacts of the program, we estimate that the kids who grew up in the neighborhoods in the treatment group, they're gonna go on to earn about $200,000 more over their lifetimes than kids in the control group. And so from that perspective, this small modification of the program has an enormous social return. So that kind of uh, uh, effort, I think, has the potential to scale, to some extent at least. And so, you know, in fact, what's happened since then is there was a bill passed in Congress authorizing $80 million of funding, shown on the left here, with bipartisan sponsors, to uh, replicate what we did in Seattle in eight other cities across America. That demonstration is currently happening. But even more importantly, there's now another bill that's been proposed that uh, proposes to expand the housing voucher program by $5 billion per year, motivated by a lot of the evidence that I've been showing you to provide more vouchers, provide more of the social support, and potentially make the program much more effective. And that's a kind of one kind of approach that I think that can be very effective. It's not just about vouchers. Just to quickly show you another approach that I think you know, where changing policies can be very relevant. Let's come back to Charlotte, showing you the map that I've shown you before. But now I'm overlaying here in the black dots the, most, the, the places where low-income housing tax credit subsidized properties were built in Charlotte over the past 30 years. And here you see a pattern very similar to what I showed you with the places where voucher holders were living, which is that these LIHTC properties, which are meant to create affordable housing, they're completely concentrated in the low opportunity areas rather than the high opportunity areas in the city. And so it's not actually obvious that this program on which we spend about $7 billion per year is uh, creating more economic mobility. In fact, it might be reducing economic mobility by concentrating poverty in the areas that currently offer lower levels of opportunity. So another thing that could potentially be modified, in this case, even by local policy changes and local incentives. Okay, so in the remaining couple of minutes, I wanna briefly touch on the other buckets as well, more quickly. So. Uh, as I was saying earlier, helping people move to different areas is one approach, but it's not scalable. So I think we need to think about how we can also bring opportunity to people where they currently live. This area of work is much less developed than the first bucket that I just showed you. We're still trying to figure out exactly what works in this domain. What I wanna do here is just give you a flavor of the kind of program or kind of approach that I think can potentially make a, a difference. As an example, not as the only possible solution. So coming back to what happened in Charlotte, I think Charlotte is a great example here of, of uh, what I'm just about to talk about. So as I said, when we put out that study, there was a lot of momentum here, the leading on opportunity group, the task force to try to think about how to create more economic opportunity. As you all know, many different things have happened in the city over the past 10 years. I'm gonna pick one example which is what Bank of America did uh, in this context, which is to make a commitment to hire um, many people who grew up in disadvantaged communities in Charlotte itself and teamed up with Year Up, a sectoral job training provider, to equip people from the local community with the skills needed to get those jobs that they were advertising. So basically recognizing that while Bank of America was bringing many jobs to Charlotte, it was not necessarily creating more mobility for the people growing up in Charlotte itself. And this was an approach targeted at the communities that were most disadvantaged within Charlotte itself to create more opportunity there. Now, we'll have to wait to see exactly how this particular effort uh, pans out in terms of the impacts that it has. But just to show you why I think it's a very promising approach, you can look back to historical data at a randomized trial that was done of this year up job training program, similar to the randomized trial I described in Seattle, where they took a set of folks 
uh, all of whom had not gone down the traditional college pathway, came from disadvantaged lower income families. Uh, those shown in the green here in the treatment group were given access to the year up one year job training program uh, at, at what is shown as year zero. Those in the control group did not. And here we're linking that data to data from tax records and looking at their earnings over time. And you can see that after people participate in this program, their earnings go up by 35% and they're on a very different career trajectory relative to folks in the control group. Once again, the key theme of this year up job training program is that it has an important social capital, social support element where they're not just teaching you a technical skill like IT, they're connecting you to a particular employer like Bank of America, and they're providing the social support needed to get that particular job and so on, echoing a theme that I've been emphasizing throughout this talk. Final point before we turn to the discussion, just want to make a brief, uh, sh show you some data on higher education, especially uh, given where we're sitting today. So similar to how our team has constructed statistics on economic mobility for every neighborhood in America, we've also constructed statistics on economic mobility for every college in America. Each college in America is represented by a different dot here. What I'm gonna do is subset that to the set of colleges here and some of the colleges here in the North Carolina area. And in the context of thinking about colleges' contribution to economic mobility, you wanna think about two different axes which um, Dr. Geber actually um, touched upon in her introduction. So the first shown on the vertical axis here is what we're calling the upward mobility rate among the set of students you have on campus from low income families. Here we're defining as families in the bottom 20% of the income distribution. What fraction make the leap to the top 20% of the income distribution? And so if you look at one of the colleges here in North Carolina, Duke University, you know, Duke looks terrific on that dimension. It's among the best colleges in America in terms of your chances of reaching the top, uh, conditional on starting in a low-income family if you attend Duke. But of course, if you think about it, what matters for a college's contribution to economic mobility is not just outcomes, but how many low-income kids you have on campus to begin with. And Duke, like Harvard, like a number of other selective private colleges, has very, very few kids from low-income families on campus. And so as a result, just mechanically, it is impossible that a college like that can contribute a whole lot to, to economic mobility. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, you have a number of community colleges that do provide access to many, many low-income students. But unfortunately, when we look at many of these community colleges and look at outcomes after college, we don't see uh, you know, great chances of reaching the middle class or beyond. We don't see great outcomes. And so if you think about it conceptually, the key problem in the higher education system in the United States, and you can see that borne out here in North Carolina, is that there's basically a lack of dots in the upper right side of this chart. You don't have a lot of places that are providing a lot of access and have great outcomes. I will note that if you look at UNC Charlotte, for example, it would actually be a leader in economic mobility, very much consistent with the statistics that the chancellor um, you know, cited in the introductory remarks that you know, it has relatively high access compared to places like Duke and UNC Chapel Hill and so on, and has quite good outcomes. And as a result, if you take the product of those things and look at how many kids came from low-income families and end up really succeeding, institutions like this one are really key, in my view, in increasing economic mobility going forward and expanding that kind of access and improving outcomes at these institutions is, is really critical. So let me conclude by uh, you know, talking about uh, bring this back to Charlotte. So as uh, many of you know, uh, and as I pointed out at the beginning, there have been many efforts in Charlotte uh, supported by many partners uh, you know, here in this room that have sought to make a difference here in Charlotte uh, to increase economic opportunity. That's been incredibly inspiring to me personally and to many other researchers uh, and practitioners uh, around the country. I think one question that folks are probably wondering about, a natural one to ask is, has all this made a difference? Where are things headed in Charlotte uh, going forward? Uh, next year, early next year, we'll put out a new study. The next study that we're working on is kind of a 10-year update of the statistics that we put out back in 2014. What does economic mobility look like across America 10 years later? Uh, and how have things changed by race and class and so on? We're, we haven't put that out publicly yet, but let me just end by saying that I think you all are gonna be encouraged by what you see uh, in that new study. <laughs> Thanks for your efforts. Thanks so much.
All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chetty. Well, we got a, uh, a teaser there, uh, kind of intriguing place to start. Um, and you took my first question, which was, how are we looking 10 years out? So, um, by the way, I'm Eli Portillo with WFAE News. Nice to see you. Thank you all for being here. So to kind of turn that question around, 10 years on from the initial study, how do you feel about the way it's landed with different communities and different yeah. local policymakers? And um, you know, what, um, what, if anything, has surprised you about the reactions to your research and those uh, original economic mobility rankings? Yeah, so th uh, thanks, Eli. So um, you know, I think what I was most struck by, so when I was doing this work initially as a researcher interested in these questions, it hadn't occurred to me how putting out these data publicly could really spur public action. And even though we didn't know what the answer was in terms of how to improve things, and you can see I shared how we've tried to make progress on that question, we're getting a sharper understanding. But certainly back in 2014, if you were to ask me, what are the three things, four things I should do to increase economic mobility, wouldn't have had a clear sense. Um, what I was struck by is simply putting out the statistics really motivated a lot of change. I think Charlotte is uh, you know, really exemplary of that. And I find when I talk to people across the country, many people look to Charlotte as an example of a place that took those statistics and didn't take it as kind of, oh, those statistics must be wrong, or there's some reason everything's actually OK here, but rather say, OK, let's constructively think about what we can do going forward. Um, and what's been very inspiring is to see you know, similar efforts in a number of places where we're starting to see some measurable impacts, right? I mean, one thing to note is even a 10-year horizon, I mean, these things are slow moving, right? We're talking about uh, patterns that have probably persisted for generations, racial divides, and so on. So this is not going to change. You know, many people have asked me, well, why don't you put out these data on an annual basis? Did it change, you know, next year? Well, there's just no way that's going to change enormously over a one-year period. Um, but we're starting to see with some of the programs that I've been showing you that you can have a measurable impact. And when you do lots of things with this unified focus on economic mobility, as you all have had here, I think it can really move the needle. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say uh, probably no one has kicked off more initiatives, investments. Um, uh, <laughs> a lot of folks here are involved in them in the past uh, decade than you with that research. Um, do you think that policymakers risk getting too focused on the headline number, the 50 out of 50. Um, I mean, I was a reporter at The Observer when that article you showed was there. And um, I feel like, you know, if we were 47th out of 50, we wouldn't be here right now. <laughs> so maybe it's good but you were we would, 50 Yeah, but 50, we would yeah. still have the same community, <laughs> the same dynamics. Um, what do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is more your domain than mine, but my sense is, you know, media and the way things are publicized and communicated does matter. And there was a resonance to 50 out of 50 as opposed to 49 out of 50. I think it was Atlanta that happened to be 48 or 49 out of 50. And I have the not a word. had a similar uh, <laughs> conversation in, in Atlanta. Um, so I don't know if, you know, the way you cut the data, is there a huge difference between 49 out of 50 and 50 out of 50? Probably not, right? These things are kind of similar to each other. But I think these kinds of comparisons can be motivating. And I think especially in a place like Charlotte, I think what's most striking about Charlotte to me is it's a city that if you look at any conventional measure of income growth, the number of high paying jobs, as you all know, if you just drive around the city today versus 20 years ago, it's clearly doing very well if you look at any repeated snapshot of data. What was new in these data is saying that's not reflected in the experiences of the kids who are growing up in the city in low and middle income families. And I think what that shows is there's a missed opportunity there because clearly it's not because of a lack of jobs or a lack of potential. You know, in other cities, you might argue, well, it's a declining city, manufacturing's moving out, et cetera. There are other kind of global economic challenges. That's not the problem Charlotte has. And I think that's why it's a great case to try to tackle these issues. So as you cut the data more granul granularly and zoom into the neighborhood census tract level, you, know, you see this map that we're all really familiar with here in Charlotte and in this room of a crescent and wedge where the parts of the city look very different. Um, and it's, it's like a fractal pattern where you zoom in and every layer you keep getting the same pattern. 
um, has, oh, someone take your call, um, <laughs> has that more granular um, look at cities and look at regions influenced how you think about the big picture as you zoom in on the little picture? And how yeah. has that changed your thinking? Yeah. I think what I hadn't appreciated when we put out the initial study is that actually what we were seeing, exactly as you put it with that fractal analogy, is the product of some a process that's emerging at a much more local level. So it's not like a Charlotte-wide phenomenon. It's not a Chicago-wide phenomenon. It's something that's happening at a much more local level. And it just makes you think about a very different set of policy solutions. It's not about you know, changing tax rates at a broad level in a given city. I mean, that can obviously matter, but it's something about why the interactions you're having in one community versus another nearby community are extremely different. And so it just makes you think, I think, about a much more local set of solutions than simply thinking about federal policies. Although obviously federal policies provide the architecture for a lot of what's happening at a local level, like the examples I gave with the housing vouchers or the low income housing tax credit. And pulling back to that big picture view, when you look at the country as a whole, you know, it looks like there's something wrong with the South. And both those maps you showed were kind of like this big splash of red um, across the South and other areas too, but it's very obviously Pronounced. noticeable. Um, what is different about this region on a broader level? What is driving that? Yeah. So a couple of things. So first, you know, you can't understate the importance of race. So if I showed you that those maps broken down by race and ethnicity, you would see lower levels of economic mobility for white Americans as well in the South, but you would see distinctly lower levels of economic mobility for black men, as I was emphasizing, in particular relative to white men across the entire United States. How does that play into the national map that I started out with? Well, you know, as you all know, there's a larger concentration of black folks in the South and the Southeast. And so that difference by race is gonna be manifested as a difference across places, the South versus say rural Iowa. Um, you know, part of it is due to those racial disparities. But even holding fixed race, there are big differences in economic opportunity. And here I would come back to that slide I had with the four factors. So if, you, if I showed you maps of the degree of integration, how much segregation is there across communities, measures of the quality of schools, fraction of two-parent families, measures of social capital, they would all have that same uh, basic pattern of uh, you know, more segregation in the South, for example, as you saw less social capital, more division across class lines. And so it's those very same factors that I think are driving the regional differences that you're seeing there. And one thing that strikes me about this work and your work in general is how interconnected everything is. You know, you can't talk about residential segregation without talking about school segregation, without talking about race, without talking about, you know, people's access through different uh, transportation and transit to different areas. It's all a web. But the way we approach these is often in isolation, one silo at a time. How important is it to break those silos? And are you seeing at a local level specifically mm -hmm. more policymakers understanding that and mm -hmm. working towards that? Yeah. So, I mean, I think you're absolutely right that this is kind of an interconnected process where it can either be a, you know, a virtuous circle or a vicious cycle, right? And so uh, I think what that calls for is a coordinated approach. And this is what I see to some extent here in Charlotte, where if you define increasing economic opportunity as the goal, you can bring to the table folks whose you know, fundamental focus is on transportation or schools or on higher education and figure out how you connect all these things to actually make it work. Now, one thing I would note is if you take that view that everything's interconnected, I think that can be both a challenge and an opportunity. It can be a challenge in the sense that everyone is kind of tempted to pass the buck on to somebody else. You know, in the education system, like how can I possibly fix all the problems just in the K through 12 system when there's so much segregation and there are issues with affordable housing and that kind of logic, I think there's some truth to that, but there's a danger in that as well because everyone can have the perspective of, you know, this is not my problem to solve, but it also creates an opportunity in the sense that if we come together and work on these issues, it can create a more positive cycle that I think can really lead to fundamental change. And 
specifically around the schools, one of the uh, the things I found most fascinating with the Social Capital Atlas is that you can you know get down to the level of individual uh, high schools and colleges, mm -hmm. and I think at that level you can really see the difference, kind of the two worlds. Like if you look at West Charlotte High School, um, about I think 18 or 19 percent of low income uh, folks from there there. Uh, about 18% of their acquaintances are high income. If you look at Providence High School, about 10 miles away, it's 84%. Mm -hmm. So you've really got two worlds and the student bodies look very different. One majority black and low income, mm -hmm. one majority white and high income. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that there would be mm -hmm. differences there, but what does that say to you or tell you about the way we've organized our city and our schools and crucially, the opportunity that the kids at those schools are yeah. going to have? Yeah. So that example you give, which is very stark, you know, that highlights, I think, the potentially pernicious effects of segregation, where you're really limiting opportunities for some kids by having communities that are so split by race and class and so on. But what I would highlight more generally when we think about this notion of cross-class interaction is that surely segregation matters. You can't be friends with people you never meet. So obviously the first step towards creating more cross-class interaction is having more integrated schools, neighborhoods, and so on. But we find in that same paper and that same data that you're referencing that there's another dimension that's extremely important that we call friending bias, which is even conditional on being at the same school, we find that kids tend to befriend kids who are like them in terms of class or in terms of race. And it turns out that about half of the social disconnection between low and high income people in America is driven by this friending bias rather than a lack of exposure. The reason I emphasize that is if you think about policy solutions, in the context of exposure, there are lots of things that have been attempted in Charlotte that have been discussed around the country, things like busing, changes in zoning regulations, changes in voucher programs, and so forth, that are all efforts to basically bring people together physically. But what we're finding is that that's only half the issue. Even if you manage to perfectly integrate every school, every neighborhood, every college, which would be incredibly difficult to do, you'd still have half of the cross-class disconnection left. And so I think it's equally valuable to think about how you tackle that latter piece. How do you actually bring people together, even when they're in attending the same school, possibly by changing the groups in which they interact? We find, for example, that there's a lot more cross-class friendship made. Cross-class friendships are much more likely to emerge in faith-based uh, religious organizations or in recreational groups than in other settings, or in smaller, smaller schools than in larger schools. So there may be other ways that we should be thinking about to create more of this cross-class interaction that would be in some ways easier, perhaps, to address than the stark example you gave of integration. And I think in, uh, in Charlotte, as in a lot of cities, if you kind of trace the history of residential segregation, you know, you get back to kind of the original sin in some ways of zoning, which um, has strongly influenced how we've built different neighborhoods, who has access to them. Um, I know we've got uh, Tom Hanchett here who wrote a great book, Sorting Out the New South City, tracing the history of sh how Charlotte became segregated and the role of zoning and things like redlining in that. I'm curious how powerful you think interventions like uh, you know, allowing duplexes yep. and triplexes, things Charlotte is doing, yep. uh, can be to address that. Are those uh, effective interventions, do you think, or what does that look like? Yeah, yeah. So certainly multifamily zoning or upzoning in various ways, I think, could potentially permit denser building in high opportunity areas and has the potential to address some of the issues that I was describing. Now, will that necessarily happen? I don't think we know for sure yet. I haven't seen a study that says a city that adopted changes in zoning regulations, we see more building in high opportunity areas, and that has led to better outcomes. I, I simply think we don't have an empirical answer to that question yet. I do think it creates that capacity. At, at the same time, I think one needs to, that can't be the only solution, right? I mean, there's still going to be a large group of people living in the Crescent in Charlotte, no matter how you change zoning regulations in other places. And I think while we do that and create more access to high opportunity neighborhoods, we also need to be thinking about how we invest in lower opportunity neighborhoods to create more opportunity there by making investments in the schools, trying to 
you know, per, perhaps provide better access to job training programs or at institutions like UNC Charlotte? How do you reach out to kids in those communities and support them to be able to make the transition to an institution like this and get on a, on a successful career trajectory, things like that? And one of the initiatives in Charlotte that's gotten a lot of attention uh, recently is Renaissance West, which is um, a plan that demolished a failing school and then uh, a low income housing community and replaced them with mixed income housing, better services, um, wraparound services, a school with you know an all new academic focus, um, increased resources. And I think it's produced some improved outcomes, but I don't think anyone would argue that it solved all the problems mm -hmm. of that community. Is that the kind of initiative we need to be thinking about? And then as a follow-up to that, since you mentioned scalability, mm -hmm. you know, that's very, very expensive. Yeah. How should communities with limited resources think about those kind of really big interventions? Yeah, yeah. So I do think that kind of intervention, you know, I don't know about that specific case, but more generally interventions that look like that reminds me a bit of the Harlem Children's Zone uh, in New York City. More broadly, we've been studying the HOPE 6 revitalization program, another study we're working on billions of dollars spent across the US on revitalizing areas that had high poverty public housing projects. And we're seeing promising signs in terms of how those programs can have an impact over time. One thing I would caution is people are often, again, looking for impact very quickly. We always find these dosage effects where it takes years to see the impacts really emerge. It's not like you just flip a switch and suddenly everything's a lot better. So I would encourage everyone here, you know, it's really key to be patient to see the fruits of uh, these kinds of interventions. <clears throat> the, I mean, coming to the question about costs, I think the reality here is we found time and again that you kind of get what you pay for in this context. I think there's been a temptation in our field to look for uh, things like nudges or very low cost interventions that are somehow gonna dramatically change people's lives. There may be a couple cases where you can find something like that, but in reality, to, to really change things, I mean, take the Seattle example I was giving you. We spent $2,500 per family. That is not a tiny sum, but it's not an enormous sum either relative to the magnitude of the program on which we're spending you know, billions of dollars per year. Uh, and so I think at that kind of scale, there are things that we can do, especially with better data, you know, targeted job training programs, targeted changes in schools to improve the quality of teachers or reduce class sizes and so on that can have quite significant payoffs. But I think the reality is, if you do something on the scale of the project you were describing, Renaissance West, you're likely to get an even bigger return if done well. So that's one message for everyone in this room who's involved with programmatic work is, it takes a long time, and I think that might be a tough message for some of the electeds in this room who are facing the voters every two years to hear. Um, is that a frustrating part of your work that you know people want to know the one thing from you that like, what's, what's the secret? Yeah. Tell us the secret and we'll do it and we'll do it next year and yeah. be done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I would like to find that myself, right? I mean, it's not just like, but, uh, you know, let me say something methodologically that I think is helpful in the context of what you're describing. So the challenge in this work is that if you define the outcome as economic opportunity mobility, you're really gonna see the effect only 20 years later, by definition, right? You're talking about helping kids when they're five or 10 years old, you're only gonna see their earnings when they're 25, 30 years old. So one of the things we've been working on is trying to construct a set of earlier indicators that might be reliable predictors for those later outcomes that can kind of shorten that feedback loop. So you can start to see, based on things like test scores in schools or attendance rates, or maybe who people are becoming friends with, or measures of non-cognitive skills in various ways. I mean, it remains to be understood exactly what those predictors would be, but the hope is we can start to give you a sense, an early sense of whether your program seems to be headed in the right direction, waiting a couple years rather than 20 years. Don't quite have that yet, but I think that's the kind of thing we need in order to be able to really deal with both the issues you, you raised in terms of political cycles and also actually figure out what's working and find better solutions for everyone. I have one last question here, and you know, it's, uh, it's a bit more personal. Your work has made me kind of 
reconsider my own life story. I uh, grew up um, in a single parent household, uh, lower income. Hi, mom, I think you're watching. Um, <laughs> and I was, you know, worked hard, meritocracy, all that stuff. But I grew up in Montgomery County, Maryland, which is consistently ranked as one of the most affluent counties mm -hmm. and has access to great public schools. I had friends who, you know, whose parents were literally in Congress. So I had a lot of social capital. And it's made me just think a lot about the role of luck and place in my own life. And we've got a room here full of smart, successful, hardworking people. Is one of the implicit lessons of your research that maybe we should all be more humble? I appreciate your sharing. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. You know, so I teach this class at Harvard to 500 freshmen called Using uh, Big Data to Solve Social Problems. And the first exercise I have them do is say, you know, you're sitting here in this theater here in Harvard. Let's try to think about what your life might have looked like if you had grown up two miles down the road rather than where you did, and you know, use that as a way to kind of contextualize wh why people are where they are. I mean, no doubt hard work and effort matters, but I think you're, you're absolutely right. I think part of what we're seeing with these data, and I think it's been helpful in framing the public narrative, is that opportunity really matters. I mean, you look at kids who basically got lucky and got a chance to move to one place relative to another, or, made a connection, happened to have access to an institution of higher education. There are a bunch of junctures like this that basically help shape. They don't determine, but they help shape where we are. And so I think you know, part of uh, our responsibility for all of us who are lucky to be here is to try to think about how we can share those opportunities more widely, building on the luck that we've had. So I'm very grateful that you all are focused on exactly that. Thank you, Dr. Thanks. Chetty. Thank you. Well, I once again want to thank Dr. Chetty for a truly thought-provoking presentation. We appreciate that. I want to thank WFAE once again for your partnership on this event. And Eli, I want to thank you for leading a truly engaging discussion. That was wonderful. Thank you all for being here tonight. We hope that you will help us continue this conversation. We invite you to join us for the Shul webinar series on February 1st featuring faculty research focused on economic mobility in the Charlotte region. I now invite everybody to join us for a post-reception outside the room, this room, and Dr. Chetty will join us for a bit. Thank you all very much for being here. Go Niners!